introduction to diagnostic radiography today. Uh, my name is Fiona and I'm one of the widening participation managers here at St George's University of London and I'm just going to be hosting today's event. Um, so just to let you know there it should be a chat box um, that you can see um, on GoToWebinar and you can submit all your questions through there. So we have a whole host of staff who will be able to answer your questions today. So we have um, a member from the course team, we also have student support staff and current students um, who are in admission staff as well. So do please um, pop your questions into the chat box throughout and we'll try to answer those as best we can. Um, if you have any issues with the session, if you're not able to, if you can come out of the session at any point, do just press the original join link and you'll be able to join straight back in. We will be recording this session as well and it will be up on our website in a few days. So if you miss anything, don't worry, you'll be able to watch that recording. Um, there will be a survey at the end of the event as well, so at about quarter past five. So do please fill that in if you're still here at that point, because we'd really like to get your feedback on how you found today's event. And um, let's see what else. So in terms of how today is going to run and the schedule. So first off, I'm going to be showing you in a few minutes a video from our head of student services, Gavin Taylor, just talking to you a little bit about the student support we have here at St. George's. Um, then at about five past, we'll be having a course talk from the course director of diagnostic radiographer, Tony Dennis. After that, we'll be having a student panel where you'll get to hear from students who uh, in years one and three of the diagnostic radiography course about their experiences here. And after that, we'll have an opportunity for a live Q&A where you can speak to um, Tony and the students and ask them any questions you have. OK, so that's kind of how today is going to run. At this point, I'm going to start off just by playing you a video where you can hear a little bit more about student support here at St George's. Hello, everyone. My name is Gavin Taylor and I'm the head of student services here at St George's. Today I'm going to talk to you about some of the support services that we have for students here at St George's. Many of the services we offer are badged under our Student Centre or Student Life Centre banners, and these include things like health, well-being, learning support, finance and accommodation services. Let's have a look at each of those in turn, and I'll give you some highlights of each of the services as we go through. So the first place to start is uh, health. Um, and uh, let's talk about occupational health. Now, the occupational health team are there to ensure that students and staff are fit to undertake their work or their study alongside patients. Um, and they're the ones in the application process um, who will ask you for reports about your health um, and will undertake tests and vaccinate you as necessary. OH are also there to make sure that any health conditions that might affect patient safety are appropriately managed. So they don't vanish on day one of your course. Uh, they're with you all the way through and all the way through your career, in fact, to make sure that you are healthy and OK and all right to work with patients. Now, universities will take a variety of different approaches to supporting the health of their students. Uh, you may find if you've been looking at large campus universities, they've got a health center there on campus. At St. George's, because we're an urban university, um, we work closely with our local GPs, and there are about 20 of them within about a kilometer of the St. George's campus to ensure that everyone has access to all the services that they need. Most of the local surgeries will actually come onto campus for our freshers' fair in your uh, first week, um, and they'll get everybody signed up there um, and um, accessing their services as they go through. That's how we approach um, your health while we're uh, studying. Um, moving on to look at student well-being. Um, so the, the place to start with this one is your personal tutor. So every student at St George's is assigned a personal tutor from the very first day. Now tutors have an academic role. Um, they'll be giving you some of your assessments while you're in study. Um, they also have a, a very strong pastoral one so they're there to make sure that you're okay and succeeding um, and doing your very best right the way through and that's a big strength of the size of St George's. Our small size lets us offer that to everybody and I think it's a real strength of what we do. Now, as well as your tutor and as well as the specialist staff on my team in the Student Life Center, um, St. George's has a very large for our size and very well used counseling service, um, as well as a psychiatrist in house to support students mental health. We've also got a thriving faith community for a 
Science based university um, and a chaplaincy that looks after both the university staff and students and the staff at the NHS Trust as well. And we work closely with our students' union in all kinds of different things from faith right the way through to all the different activities that they offer to make sure that there's a comprehensive network of support um, within the SU and the university and the Trust next door and all the way through all around our students while they're studying with us. From well-being, let's have a look at some of the learning support that's on offer. So uh, again, universities will have different approaches to writing and study skills support, but all of them will have some. Um, here at George's, we operate an academic success center, um, and that's led by three senior lecturers who are there to really make sure that every student at St. George's does as well academically as they possibly can. Um, that includes all kinds of different things from English as a second language su uh, support through uh, writing skills um, and even uh, A-level refresher catch-up sessions for our graduate entry students. So if you're feeling a bit rusty in the chemistry or the stats, um, they'll get you back up to speed when you uh, start with us at George's. We also believe that we've got an ethical as well as a legal obligation to support disabled students. Now, I do get approached from time to time with students concerned that their disability uh, may be a barrier to them taking up their place in a healthcare profession. Um, so just to say from the outset, there are very few, if any, barriers uh, to disabled people entering the healthcare profession. There's really no barrier there. And our aim is to ensure that our support is just as rounded as possible to make sure that everybody is supported. Um, and that includes the academic dimension as well as uh, the clinical placements and other things that you'll be doing, as well as all the stuff that surrounds those things like your housing and other things as well. Now, it is worth just saying that talking to us early if you're disabled really does help us make sure that everything is in place to start supporting you from the very beginning of your studies. It can take a while to get everything up and running and in place that you need. So please do talk to us nice and early so we can make sure that everything is up and running and going. Now, it's also worth just saying that um, some students, um, about 50% of people with a specific learning difficulty, find that out at university. Um, and so we offer free assessments uh, to all students um, and free specialist support as well, if that's the situation that you might find yourself in. So let's have a look at finance. So um, I guess the, the first thing that I'd like to say here is really just to reassure you um, there are 2.5 million university students in the UK at the moment. Now, these are folk who are on the same financial footing um, as you will be when you are studying. Uh, the amounts of money involved in higher education at the moment are daunting. Uh, student loans are large. Fees look big. Um, and there's a lot to think about. But just remember, there are 2.5 million people who are managing OK on it. Um, it's not a uh, necessarily an easy thing, but it is a thing that people can do and you can do it too. And we are here to help you do it. So um, just some things to keep in mind. UK tuition fees are currently uh, £9,250. They are largely set by Parliament. Um, will we see things change in the next few years before you start? That's a possibility. Um, and we'll communicate that all the way through. But just for the moment, the data we've got, 9250. Um, Maximum maintenance loan, so this is for UK students um, who are living away from the family home in London. The maximum amount you can get in a loan from Student Finance England is £12,382 per year. Um, and also just to note that students who are undertaking training towards allied health professions, so physiotherapy, radiography, paramedic science, uh, and include, indeed our colleagues doing midwifery and nursing, um, they are also eligible for a bursary from the NHS. Um, of £5,000 per academic year as well. Now, if you're taking out a student loan, there are no upfront costs for attending university. So the Student Finance England or the Scottish equivalent or the Welsh equivalent or the Northern Irish equivalent will pay for your fees. Um, and everybody is guaranteed to receive that loan if they apply for it. So if you're a UK student and it's your first degree, if you're not taking a, uh, a degree, uh, an undergraduate degree for the second time, you are eligible to have it funded by government. Now, the loans that you take out, both for your tuition fees and for your maintenance costs, become repayable after graduation once you're earning more than £27,000 per year. 
Uh, also, just to note that tuition fee and maintenance support is available for all of the programs at St. George's, um, including graduate entry pre-registration courses. Now, you may have heard that, um, it, as indeed I've just said, uh, that there are limited funds for uh, people who are doing a second undergraduate degree. Now, just to note that for MBBS4, for the Graduate Entry Medicine Program at George's, and the MSc Physiotherapy Program, they are exceptions to that rule. So those courses are uh, fully funded from a variety of different means um, for your studies uh, for the years that you're in. So um, do bear that in mind. Uh, also, just to add, hardship funds are available for all students. We've got a pot of money aside for students who find themselves in unexpected difficulty while they're studying, as will most places. If you find yourself in financial difficulty at any point, do just get in touch and we can help. Now, there are some things that you can start doing now. So I think we're quite early in the application process as I'm talking to you today. So there are some things to get underway with. I think the most important one of those is to get a budget together um, for your tuition and maintenance costs and for the amount of money that you might have coming in. Now, there are some great budgeting tools and some finance calculators available online to help you do that. You can find those by checking our website. We'll point you at uh, the, various, the various calculators or the NHS one or the um, Student Finance England one, um, or just Google them. There are loads of things out there, and you can work out within about 20 minutes of online searching just how much you're likely to have as income and how much you're, you're likely to spend uh, as a student living in London um, and let you, let you work yourself out of budget for the, the years that you'll be in study. It's really important to do that. It's also a really good idea to look at other sources of funding beyond Student Finance England or the NHS. There are a huge number of trusts and charities and other organizations that are there to support students in higher education, especially those students that are doing healthcare courses. So do get out and have a look for those as well. And then lastly, a quick look at accommodation. So um, things to know there, most undergraduate students, certainly at St. George's, live in halls of residence with us in year one, and then move out into private accommodation uh, nearby in subsequent years. That's the typical pattern. Um, we own our own halls of residence, Horton Halls. It's about a mile away from the university main campus, and it houses 480 students. That's about 80% of our first year intake who live in halls of residence with us. Um, now, we guarantee places in halls uh, to our international students, uh, disabled students, and students with other welfare needs. We prioritize places for all other first year students. That includes graduate entry medics, that includes um, master's physician associate students, that includes MSc physiotherapy students. Uh, we have great thriving communities of our graduate entry and postgrad students in halls as well. Um, our halls is for everyone. It, similarly, we don't prioritize places based on postcode or distance from campus. So we are looking for folk uh, who want to get away and have a, uh, a moving out of home campus based university experience, even if they live in London already. Um, we're here for you. Uh, in terms of rent, um, to note, we benchmark our rents against uh, local private housing as well as other halls of residence. There's been a great uh, boom in the recent years of uh, private companies coming into the student residential sector uh, that has driven prices up. What we do is we make sure that we benchmark against what housing actually costs in our local area, not just what housing costs look like in higher education. Um, and we keep our rents firmly under control that way. I'd never argue seriously to anybody that uh, staying in halls of residence, even with us, was an inexpensive option. But I would argue looking against local rents, we certainly are a less expensive option in a lot of cases. And halls is an extension of our student services team and is a central part of what we do as a welfare provision. So we really are there to support everybody to uh, move in, start university, have a great time, really get underway with your studies um, and, and really get you off on the right foot in terms of university and on into your future career. So it's a, it's a big part of what we do. And I think Halls is a really terrific uh, opportunity and, and a really excellent thing to do in your first year. So that's largely it from me. Um, we've got some of my colleagues who are in the chat already for this webinar. So you can dive in and ask them questions. If you've got anything else that you'd like to know, um, you can contact us through the inquiries team. They'll pass on any uh, individual or complex questions, and we're very, very happy to answer them. Uh, so please just ask us. Um, and 
a slight bonus for me. I'm aware sometimes that we don't just have future students looking at this, but we also have mums and dads uh, looking at this as well. So if you are a mum and dad watching or you want to, uh, to let them know a few things if they're concerned, here are a few things that I'd like them to know as well. Um, so uh, the first of that is George's is one of the safest campuses in London per the Metropolitan Police stats. Um, we are a very safe place. We're in a very, very safe part of uh, a big city. Um, students don't behave as you'd imagine is another thing I'd like you to know. Our students typically, as are many university students, our students typically are uh, in employment. Uh, they are typically involved in community activities. Um, the local community is usually very pleased to see our students coming rather than the opposite. Um, they really are a huge boon to the local area. Um, and so our students are are not as students might normally be perceived to be. Um, universities and George's included will offer support and training to new students and don't pull any punches. We do do um, anti-racism training in our first week. We do anti-sexual violence training in our first week. We don't pull any punches about what our community is about um, or what sort of profession that folks are trying to get into. So um, that will happen in the first week to keep everybody safe, to introduce them to community and really get them thinking about what's gonna come ahead. Um, we usually can't talk to you without um, the student directly requesting. Um, and lastly, having the talk, and I don't mean that talk, I mean a talk about finances is hugely invaluable and really, really is probably the best thing that you can do for a student before they get off to university. Anyway, that's my time. Thank you very much for listening to me today. Um, again, there are folk available for questions in the chat um, and we're available really from now until you start and right the way through if you've got to ask us. My name's Gavin Taylor. Thank you very much uh, for coming to see us today online um, and we look forward to seeing you in the future. Okay, fabulous. So, Gav, thanks for that, Gav. Gav is actually um, in the um, chat as well. Um, so, he is um, uh, there to answer any questions um, as well. Um, if you do have anything you want to pop in the chat now. Um, now, I wanted to hand over to Tony, the course director. Are you there, Tony? I am. I'm hoping you can hear me. Yep, I will make you the presenter, so you should be able to share your screen now. Right. Um, I'm ever so hopeful that that's the right one. Yep, it definitely is. Cool. Um, Have you got your webcam on, Tony? No, no. Would you like to? I suppose to? I better do that as well as I online. It's nice. No, it's not. I don't want to scare them away just yet. Um, good afternoon. My name is Tony Dennis, um, as Fiona said, and I am the course director for diagnostic radiography. Up to 18 months ago, I would have been uh, the admissions tutor and professional uh, clinical lead. So I've moved on and up and if I'm a bit rusty, it's because I've not done this talk for about 18 months, two years, so I do apologise now. Um, so, introduction to radiography at St George's University of London. I've got two screens, so on the right hand side um, is the presentation, so I'm going to keep scanning back to that one if I may. Um, diagnostic radiography, the programme that we have at um, St George's was validated in 2018. It is the sixth incarnation of the degree. We revalidate every five years. Um, and as with our previous incarnations, it does give you eligibility to um, join the Society and College of Radiographers, which is our, um, our professional body, um, and the Health and Cares Professional Council, which is the one group that you have to work for or be registered with to be able to practice as a radiographer in the UK. Um, you don't have to be a HCP registered radio, uh, radiographer if you want to work overseas, but from working in the NHS within the United Kingdom, you have to be HCPC registered. So why diagnostic radiography? I'm sure um, anybody that's come to this webinar has actually given it some thought. Um, and the idea that we have, you know, these are some of the ideas that we feel um, people want to become. Um, 
if you think about it, 90%, 95% of all patients that go through a, a healthcare environment are going to end up within a radiography department for some form of imaging or whatever. Um, so, yeah, we are basically the one area where everybody will go to, um, be it from a trauma or be it from a, um, a, a, a relatively straightforward and planned event. So, you know, the trauma is through the accident emergency department. The planned event is coming to see the sonographers to see whether the baby is a child, girl or a boy. Um, is it growing? How it's growing and so on. So, from your point of view as a student on the program, um, you will go from A through to Z. Uh, you will be exposed to the whole gamut of imaging that we have on offer. That tied in with the fact that we have allied health professions within our, um, our centre and you will end up being taught with and by um, people that are not diagnostic radiologists. So you will end up working with and training with OTs, physiotherapists and therapeutic radiologists and paramedics to a certain extent. So why do diagnostic radiography? Well, human anatomy is a really good interest, physiology and pathology, um, but it's more about integrating the science and a technological background uh, and interest um, with healthcare and, and helping people. One of the downsides from diagnostic radiography, a lot of people find is that we don't have, you're not likely to see the same person uh, more than two or three times if you stay in an area for 30 odd years. Um, and some people don't like that. For me, it was great because you came in, you saw the person and they went on their journey, um, but you were an active part of it. So if you want continuity of care, uh, you want to be able to lift, uh, to live with um, seeing the patient go from point A to point B, point C, point D, and the same person through all those stages and diagnostic radiography. You can get it, but it's not usually the same person because of the way that we work within the department. Um, there are other professions in the healthcare, but if you want a patient, uh, job where it's always different, you never get to see the same thing twice in one day, um, never mind during the week, than diagnostic radiography um, for me was the, the way to go. And that's part of the reason why I enjoy it is the fact that it's varied. No two days are ever the same and no two hours in the same day are ever the same. Um, as with all of the um, allied health professions and any of the healthcare professions within um, the institution, we all work towards the six, care, six points of care. Um, and these are the things that as a, applicant you need to be aware of because when we do the interviews the interview questions are designed to elicit your understanding of respect and dignity commitment to quality care compassion working with people improving lives and you know the fact that everybody within the nhs and actually everybody else actually counts now the questions may seem a little bit ectopic and a little bit weird but they're all designed to find out about who you are um, and not what you can tell me about yourself it's really looking at the soft skills that are inherent in you. The ones that we don't have the ability to teach. Um, we can teach you how to do diagnostic radiography. We teach you how to talk to, compute, uh, to patients and so on. But for the compassion, the empathy, the caring aspect, that is inherent in you. Um, and that is one of the reasons why the MMIs or multi-mini interviews is actually so critical because it actually embeds in the skill set that you show us who you are rather than you tell us who you are. So what skills do you need? Skills do you need, sorry. Um, and the list and the wall uh, on the screen at the moment is really very much the two outer side ones, the core skills in the workplace are very much the ones that as, a, as anybody in healthcare, you're going to need to be able to demonstrate. Um, it's the group in the middle that is probably more critical for diagnostic radiography. If you're not interested in science, and I'm going to use the bad word, um, if you're not interested in physics, um, then what we deliver and what we have to understand is going to be a struggle. Um, physics forms the basis of our professional um, knowledge and our understanding, but it's physics in the application um, event, not the purest sense. So we're not going to sit there and teach you about Fleming's left and right hand rules about generation and so on. Um, that was something that when I was a student many years ago is how we were taught and whilst it did still be in good stead, you're never really going to figure out or need to know how to generate um, a magnetic field. 
But what you are going to need to do is understand how electrons and form to make x-rays and how we generate the x-rays and therefore how um, the patient's density and um, chemical makeup um, is going to affect the x-rays passing through it and therefore how that's going to affect the image. So it's about the application of the knowledge rather than the pure regurgitation of knowledge. And um, for some of our first years, it's a bit of a surprise um, because they didn't realize that we would need to know how to generate x-rays. Um, it's not such a case of you know, pressing the button and out pops the x-ray. Um, it seems like it and it does appear like that in certain areas um, but all of the background workings needs to be understood um, for you to be able to um, undertake the x-rays and the examinations that we do um, correctly and appropriately. Um, this is a slide from a presentation that the Society of the College of Radiographers produced in 2014 um, and it really just highlights that the first four, the main four high points or the four, the four aspects that were raised as being the most popular reason for choosing to do diagnostic radiography was job satisfaction, enjoyment, job security, uh, skills and knowledge development. And to be honest, I would actually argue that the first two, um, job satisfaction and enjoyment, are probably very similar. And uh, so you're probably closer to 99%. Um, and it's not until you get down to number four, number five, where it's fair salary and career progression. Now, most radiographers are starting about 22, 23,000 pounds, and that's without London waiting or anything else. Um, so the likelihoods are that once you graduate and start working, um, I'm afraid you're going to meet the threshold for um, fees repayment as far as the government's concerned. Um, and most of the student, most of the newly qualified radiographers that we've graduated in the last four months are in band five jobs. Um, probably about 85, 90% of them are working and the ones that aren't are actually looking to do postgraduate straight away anyway um, and they're all on the 27 28 pound salary so as a newly qualified radiographer the salary is not you know you're not going to be a millionaire working for the nhs um, but it is a fair salary um opportunities well i practiced as a radiographer and then went into teaching and i've been in teaching for the last 20 odd years um, but from when I started it was very much a case that you were either a practitioner or you went into teaching um, and the practitioner routes were you specialised in CT or MR or you became a manager. Uh, nowadays the, the opportunities from a diagnostic radiographer point of view are much much more um, clearly defined and the opportunities are very much down to you as an individual how do you want to push yourself. So once you graduate you're on the little green dot which is a practitioner and then as you progress through your time and it really is down to you to decide where you want to go within the remits of the department and the opportunities that they have to offer you can either um, stay in your place that you're working and take up the offers and opportunities that they are off on offer or you move on to um, other venues and other places to work so practitioner newly qualified three to five years advanced practitioner and then ultimately the consultant practitioner um, but the purple and the blue are opportunities for you to do postgraduate um, uh, qualifications and further qualifications and there is a need for it um, the days of just doing your job ending your career as a radio for a band five radio for band six radio for have gone everybody now wants to um, advance themselves and earn the extra money, but also have the extra responsibility and extra career um, satisfaction, I suppose, is the best one. And there's some examples there of um, what opportunities there are. It's not you start at the beginning of your education as a student, as a student and you are focused towards any of these. Our programme is designed to produce the general practitioner, the broad spectrum practitioner, which allows them to then decide once they've qualified to where they want to go. Now, I've been doing this, as I said, for a number of years, and a lot of students come in um, wanting to do mammography, wanting to do CT, want to do ultrasound, but they don't really have any other idea about what other options there are. After they've gone through the three years of their education, 
they have often either reinforced their idea that yes ultrasound's where i want to go or they've completely thrown it out and said no not a chance i'm not doing that i want to go on and do uh, reporting on and go and do interventional. So the opportunities now as a diagnostic radiography are much greater and much more prolific than they ever were when I first qualified. Um, we are currently the part of the Faculty of Health, Social Care and Education. Uh, I am employed by Kingston University, but I actually work for St George's. The radiography programmes um, and any of the programmes for joint faculty that are at St George's are all St George's University of London validated. Um, and as of the September, uh, not September, August the 1st, um, the academic staff will move from Kingston to be St George's employees. Um, and which is a shame, it, it basically means the Faculty of Health, Social Care and Education will cease to exist, it's being dissolved. And by the time that occurs, and this is right where I get to be really, really old now, I will be the last remaining member of the staff who started the at the faculty when it first came into being in 1996. Um, I'll leave you to do the maths. Um, so we are part of Kingston University of St George's at the moment, but our predominance now for, since 2018 when we first moved over, back over to George's, has been George's orientated. There's very little that we do um, at Kingston. We still have the links and I'm sure we will still have the links when the faculty is dissolved but at the moment everything that we do is all focused at St George's. We have our new labs, we have um, close working relationships with Gavin and all the other sub departments within George's um, and it really is as Gavin said and it sounds like a real cliche but it is much more of a big family than it is of a big institution. Um, this gives you a bit of an idea where we sit um, and it's the big yellow square in the middle, Centre for Allied Health, that's who we live with. Um, and then we have four set of uh, five sections. We have occupational therapy, paramedic science, diagnostic radiography, therapeutic radiography and physiotherapy. And whilst we all work together, we are very singularly dis um, separated. We basically um, are, we live in one big open plan office um, and we interact with each other but the programs themselves run very um, on their they, they run very on they run on their own um, with some joint teaching um, the joint teaching tends to be in the first year and it tends to be very much orientated towards the general skill sets that all allied health professions or any health profession needs to have so you will have in your first year in the first term before Christmas there will be sessions where you are with the whole plethora of healthcare professionals so healthcare scientists, therapeutic radiologists, diagnostic radiologists, paramedic scientists, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, MBBS or medical students, health yeah and we say healthcare students um, but there are also occasions when in the past we've also had um, pharmacy students so it's very much a, a you learn from each other and then as you go through the first year and then into the second year there will be small sessions where you will work with other professional groups um, therapeutic radiography is one of the ones we work with quite commonly because a lot of the physics um, and a lot of the key skills are very similar and then when you go into the third year it's more with the ot's the physios and the therapeutic radiographers um, purely and simply because it's about developing you for the future it's not just about yeah we'll send you out as a practitioner you can be you can do radiography, it's then tending you out um, to actually enable you to climb that pole and become the eights, uh, the six, the sevens, the eights, the advanced practitioner, the consultant practitioner, and ultimately um, start to influence the profession as a whole. Um, so our programme, and you'll get the answer, opportunity to speak to the first year and the third year. Um, we believe we're student uh, friendly and student focused. Um, we tend to know the bulk of the students and they definitely know us um, they have open access to us um, either in class or on placement um, and if there is a urgency in need from the students as Gavin said we tend to drop most things and we'll go and see them or organize to have a conversation with them um, I think throughout the pandemic uh, over the last 18 months um, everybody's become much more used to using um, visual media such as Zoom or um, MS Teams. So all of our students get tablets, so there's an opportunity to actually just interlink with those in the private corner somewhere. Um, and you know, if it's less urgent, we will book an appointment. If it's more urgent, then you know, there are times that I've 
been required to drop everything and my team have dropped everything and spent 45 minutes an hour with the student um, and we prefer we very much believe that uh, early intervention is going to make life a lot easier for everybody um, because 99 percent of it it's really just uh, a Tony, you still there? Tony, just wanted to check that you're still there. Okay, I think Tony may have dropped off the call. Yeah, so I think, oh, oh are, you, are you there, Tony? Yeah. Fab. Okay, I think we just lost you for a moment, but I'll let you um, carry oh, on. Oh, sorry. No, 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 I'm still here. I haven't gone. Um, um, so I think really a lot of the, the, the things to talk about and ask about the individual um, mechanics of the programs is probably better off asking the students to give you their perceptions. Um, but, you know, rather than me telling you that you've got all these coursework and you've got all these exams. Basically, uh, I would just say that it covers all the, the whole spectrum of his assessment strategies um, and you know it gives the students the opportunity that if they are good in exams but poor in um, coursework or vice versa it gives them the opportunity to actually um, compensate across the spectrum. Um, as we talked about we've touched on it it's the interprofessional learning um, there are excellent resources and when you come to visit and see the institution, there is opportunity to go and wander around the radiography simulation area. Um, we have a fully functioning X-ray machine, uh, X-ray lab. There's two machines in there. There's image intensifier. There's mobile image intensification. There's a mobile machine, ultrasound machines, phantom. So we can take and produce images um, in a ersatz or uh, a protected clinical environment we've also just taken delivery of a computer software package which allows us to um, allow simulation of exposure factors and the impact on the images so that's going to be integrated more fully into the education process so basically it means that you can experiment with weird and wacky exposure factors and not cause anybody any damage and not cause any risk to the patients um, and that literally just came into our remit in September of this year. Um, Gavin's talked about the student support, so I'm not going to touch on this, the um, tutor system and the academic skills development. What I would say is that we have 12 clinical sites and each one of the sites is supported by one of the academic staff. Um, and, you know, we visit on a regular basis. Inside each department is a single member staff or a group of staff that are responsible for the students that are on placement. Um, and the interactions and the communication. Um, more so, it's become much more prevalent since the pandemic, but it's always been a case of we used to speak to them, catch them up on the phone. Nowadays, the communication tends to be through a WhatsApp group. Um, so, you know, we have, each of us has our, we have our own WhatsApp group for the staff, but we're, we'll also link into the hospital side. So communication um, with the departments is much more, um, instantaneous now I suppose than it has been in the past which is a good thing uh, for the students it's a bad thing because it now means that we know exactly what's going on every moment of every day rather than us have them being able to uh, think okay fine it's going to be at least 24 hours before I get um, they find out that I wasn't in today but the idea is that it gives the opportunity for the staff and the students to actually build a much better bond and, and relationship with um, themselves in that environment um, peer mentoring, again, something that most of the institutions is doing and specialised assessment support for students with disabilities. Um, nice lady called Emma Catlow. Um, and if you have any um, seen or unseen disability issues, um, then she is the person to contact and deal with on a day by day basis. Um, Gavin's right. We do make reasonable adjustments, um, but and we can make reasonable adjustments in the in the academic environment. It becomes much much harder to make reasonable adjustments in a clinical environment, but we are required and we do make the reasonable adjustments as much as we can. 
um, what we can't do is we can't redesign an entire x-ray department to accommodate um, somebody in a wheelchair or um, somebody that is unable to see. Those are really um, the two areas that we would struggle um, with being able to accommodate. Um, academic education, basically, if there's anything on that list that you feel is a surprise, um, I'd like to have a conversation with you about it. Uh, science and technology, radiation protection, how to generate x-rays, how to be safe with it, what are you looking at, what's the pathologies, how do you demonstrate it, um, talking to the patient, research methods, and actually making sure that we do everything the right way around. Um, one of the ben benefits that all my team are diagnostic radiographers. Sorry, let me rephrase that. Uh, I'll explain them. All of my team are, di are radiographers. One is a therapy radiographer. Uh, the other nine of us are all diagnostic radiographers. So we're all practitioners to, um, or have been practitioners. So we all know what practice is like. And um, so we are teaching from either uh, a recent background or an actual work background. Um, and for the modern modalities, the cutting edge techniques, we will bring in the practitioners to deliver the keynotes lectures on those. So the big advantage of being at George's is that we have a very, very close working relationship with the radiology department down in um, St. James' Wing, and we tend to liaise with them quite frequently to get um, the professional practitioners to come in and deliver the key lecture notes, and we will do the support from there onwards. Um, third year, we're going to talk about the research project. There is a dissemination of an article, um, and the idea is that it's based on something that students have undertaken or have actually researched themselves. And then instead of actually producing a 9,000 word um, document, they produce the 2,500 word article. And the idea being that it's ready for publication. You would then publish it post qualification, um, and it will add to the research bank of diagnostic radiography. Um, you're not left there on your own, you will be supported and you're supported from year two because the proposal for your research pro dissemination article tends to be delivered or be undertaken during what's called research evidence and based practice, um, which is a second year module. So the person supporting you for the proposal will then take you on into your third year to support you through your, di your dissemination. Um, this is the first year we're going through. So my third year that's on the panel um, is between the reflect re, between the proposal and hasn't actually started the um, article yet because they are in their third clinical term. And my first year has this all to look forward to. Um, okay, so entry requirements. This is now. Um, I would recommend that you look at the St. George's um, web pages for diagnostic radiography and look at the entry criteria. G Tony, are you there? I think we may have lost Tony's audio, so I'll just wait a couple of minutes to see if he, that comes back on. Tony, are you, are you there? UCSE equivalents must have English and maths, um, and it's English language rather than uh, English and UK and ideas. Is an problem. What have you done? Where have you done? You don't want to be anything else. As long as you meet them, you will be invited in for an interview. Uh, at the moment, the interviews are remote, so you'll get questions and you have to re record yourself. Um, and then we will evaluate the, the recordings. When COVID has done and dusted and we're back to normal, then the likelihoods are we will go back to the face to face interviews because it's much more um, satisfying um, being able to see and to interact and to talk. And one of the big things with this recording is that. You know the dynamic, the, the the keenness, the opportunities for your questions in is not as um, readily available or as instantaneous as it would be if we were face to face. Um, satisfactory health clearance. Make sure you're fit and healthy. Make sure you're not going to make yourself any more unwell um, or make our patients any more unwell. Um, and 
a disclosure and barring service enhanced check to make sure that um, you've not got or done anything that is going to preclude you from a working for the NHS and b actually registering with healthcare's professions council. And then we have um, two other things. One is the student agreement, which basically says that you agree to do a, be a student and undertake all the sessions and everything else, which again is, is is fairly generic. And then we have what's called the department uniform policy, which basically says that you will happily wear the really pretty white tunic and the blue crimpoline trousers. You know, we as a profession have to abide by the NHS's bare below the elbows, and we have between 12 and 14 clinical sites, which all have um, varying levels of um, uniform policy, but they all adhere to the basic premise that it's bare below the elbows, no rolled sleeve, no sleeves rolled up like this. Um, so we put tunics up to here. Um, and you agree to follow that post that policy. Um, if you follow the policy, there is nowhere you can't go and you will be able to graduate. If you don't agree with the policy, then it becomes much, much harder for you to actually be able to undertake some of the examinations, some of the areas where you work. Um, and there's, you know, we, we, we don't have the opportunity to be able to put you into a less um, stringent area. Um, some of the professions of some of the sites that we use are, especially during COVID, and they were bad enough before COVID, but they are much more stringent during COVID, um, that staff are not allowed to go into public areas in uniform. They have to get changed into their day clothes um, or they're coming into work clothes. So everybody is much more para, um, con concerned and keen about um, infection control and cross-infection and cross-contamination. Uh, to the extent that as a radiographer, when you're doing practice, um, we will be in personal protective equipment. So a lot of our practical sessions are now students in gloves, masks and um, aprons. And it's a perfect um, training field for when they go into the departments because that's what they're wearing now on a regular basis. Uh, core structure is 50-50. Um, half of it will be in an academic environment, half of it will be clinical. I will not lie to you, it is incredibly intense. Um, we are very prescriptive when you have your holidays. There'll be three weeks at Christmas, there'll be three weeks at Easter or four weeks at Easter, and then over the summer period, you'll be off. Um, we work nine to five, Monday through Friday, both academically and clinically. Um, and the idea of it being a modular course is that you build on the information that you have acquired in from year one to year two and year two, year three. It may be assessed at the end of each module or at the end of each term, but in reality, the information that you acquire from the first year will still be reflected and still be assessed and um, will still form the foundation for when we go into year two and then on into year three. Um, as I said, it's revalid in 2018. We basically took our old degree, ripped it up, started again. So the current, um, all three years now, first, second, third year, are on the current new degree. Um, so we've not got any um, delayed students. They are all, yeah, you know, it, it gets updated on a year by year basis. And then every five years we revalidate. We're due for another revalidation in 23. Um, and the idea is that we'll see what's gone, what works well with currency and how we can improve what we currently have to make it to the next one. And that's really where we're going to be going in the next 12 months, 18 months. But from a student point of view, what you start with now is the one, the one is, is what you'll end with. As I said, it is full time, it's five days a week, it is nine to five. The institutions um, time and say that we can teach between eight o'clock in the evening, eight in the morning, six in the evening. Um, we tend to stick between the nine and five, but there will be times when we will go outside those. Clinical experience is nine to five, Monday through Friday. In your first year, in your second and third year, there will be an expectation to do extended days. So eight in the morning to eight at night, but we do three of those days in a week. And only in certain areas, because some areas don't actually run extended days. And then in your third year, um, in the majority of clinical placements, there is the opportunity to do some night duty um, and work from eight o'clock in the evening to eight o'clock in the next morning. Unfortunately, um, as you're not qualified, all of these hours are going to be unpaid um, and you will be gaining from the experience rather than gaining financially, I'm afraid. 
Um, this is gives you a rough guidance. All right, don't stick to the numbers and dates and everything else. It's really just more for a you know before Christmas you're doing this, after Christmas before Easter you're doing this, and then um, after Easter before the summer holidays you're doing this. Um, the way we've worked it out uh, and while you set it, which makes life a lot easier, is that the green, i.e., when you're on clinical. There's only ever one set of students in clinical at any one time. Um, so when you are on site and it's a unique site to St George's University of London, there will be no other clinical students on site. There are some clinical sites, some hospitals that have um, students from other institutions. Um, George's is one, Guys and Tommy's is another, Chelsea and Westminster is another one. Um, but the idea is that our students will follow their regime, their process, their road stuff. Um, and we try to minimise any negative or ne any possible impact with other students. One of the biggest ones was having 10 students from the same site made it very problematic. So what we've done is we balanced it and always there's going to be just you as students um, from St George's from this. There will only be first year students in, there will only be second year students in, there will only be third year students in. Um, simulation suite basically gives you an idea. Um, those pictures don't do us any justice. Uh, the whole of the suite cost £1.2 million. Pounds. Um, and the equipment is, well, it came out of the box in 2018. It does look old and archaic. Um, and it's very, very basic. Um, it's like learning to drive an a manual car and then being given an automatic car to, when you're in when you get given a car. Our premise is that if you can drive a manual car, you can drive any other car, be it automatic or manual. And it's the same with the equipment that we've got. Our equipment is very, very simple. There is no bells, no whistles. And if you want it to do something, you have to do it physically. Um, the only movement it has is up and down on the tube housing. Um, so it basically means that if you go to any of the 12, 14 clinical sites that we have, there is no piece of equipment that you cannot extrapolate and use your basic principles that we've taught you using the equipment we have and putting you into any environment at the department. And the students come in and the first year and sit again, saying this looks really, really old fashioned and you know, why can't you just press buttons and it all does it for you? And then they go to the departments and they appreciate that in most x-ray department, there's three or four different manufacturing types of equipment and each has its own version or own variants. And one of the benefits of actually having a simple process, simple procedures we or equipment as we have, you can take that skill set and move it on to all the other um, fancier pieces of kit. So that gives you an idea of what we have um, and you will be spending a fairly large amount of time within the practice environment being supported by uh, the academic staff um, and on occasion some of the clinical sites um, staff that we have. There will be also occasions when you will, you know, as a second year, you could be helping support a first year or a third year helping support a second year. Um, that again is something that enables you to um, acquire points and credit for the St George's Award, which is about working outside of your academic environment. Um, we've just, as I said, we just purchased Shadeware. Um, all of our students will be given access to it. They can download it for a year. At the end of the year, they will have to reload it. We put it on a yearly license so that when they do eventually graduate, they can't take it away with them. Um, tie that into the fact that we also provide tablets for our students because we use the tablets on the clinical environment. So it, it carries what we call our PAD, which is our practice assessment document. It's all electronic. You basically have to get the staff member to sign off your abilities and competencies on the tablet. So it all ties together. Um, you're given the tablet at the beginning of the first year. And when you graduate at the end of the third year, you go away with it as yours. Um, we don't ask for it back. Um, the only time we ask for it back is if you don't make it through to graduation and then we'll use it as a spare. Um, clinical education is probably the biggest area that most people will ask questions about um, and up to 18 months ago I was the person responsible for clinical education. Um, you will be supervised by qualified members of staff which I think is pretty important. Um, they will tell you whether you're doing it right or wrong and give you the confidence to be able to um, engage with the process. Um, we talked about the on-site clinical um, 
site coordinator and we will also as i said we also visit um, i visit two at the moment so that will be going down to one when our new member of staff starts so most of the clinical sites that we have have one clinical tutor or one visiting member of our academic staff as it says um 11 to 16 weeks per year um, and in years one and two, you'll go to hospital A, and in year three, you'll go to hospital B. The idea being that you will learn um, the processes and ways of doing something in one hospital, and then you'll be able to go to another hospital and learn. There are some similarities, but there are other ways of doing it, and that's much more different. Um, the Society and Colour Radi Radiographers um, are quite keen that we do multi centre. Um, delivery of edu clinical education so that students don't become parochial do not assume that this is the only way of actually undertaking the procedure um, and having been on two validations recently um, they're they're frowning upon if their right, students are only going to one there is an argument that says you only go to one um, but in reality I you know when I was a student it was I think I've been about six or seven which I think is too many um, but learning in one place for a year and a half, two years, and another place for another for the rest of that year or a year on its so, own is beneficial. It gives you opportunities to actually feel embedded within the department and feel part of the team. And that's again what it comes back to. We're all talking about being members of a huge team. Radiography is the huge team, but then again into the trust that you're actually allocated to. So you actually start working with the same people. They start to have a better understanding of you and your abilities, and you feel much more capable and comfortable um, learning within a safe and secure environment. These are the hospitals that we use um, and I'm going to be blunt at the moment um, and I apologise if it um, upsets anybody. These 12 hospitals are the only hospitals that we can utilise for our placement experience. Um, these are the ones that are validated through our programme for both the HACE um, Health and Cares Professional Council, which is our registrable body, and for the Society and College of Radiographers. If there is a hospital that you have a burning desire to go to and it's not on this list, then I'm afraid that we aren't really the best place for you to come at this point in time. We are always trying to expand and to increase, and maybe in two to three years' time, we will actually have increased the number of students, a number of sites that we have. But from starting to decide where we're going to go and where we're going to. Sorry, everyone, I think we've lost Tony's audio again, but hopefully he'll come back in a couple of minutes like he did before. We'll just hold on and wait for that to happen. Tony, are you there? Use them to actually be validated as a two-year process. So at the moment, I don't have any that are in the but um, at the moment, it's much better than the others. So students want to go to the Guys and Tommies. So one of the problems with um, lots of students want to go to Guys and Tommies, St. Helias, uh, some Chelsea, and Westminster, and George's. Um, but those are the sites that we share with other people. And the one of the I, I think you know if you've got a big hospital, you can be easily lost. If you've got a small hospital. You get much more. Um, you, you get a much greater frequency of staff, um, and you can actually um, learn and be supported in a much more closely knit environment. The other thing is, you will be allocated to one of these two hospital, one of these twelve hospitals for the first for hosp as hospital A, and then you'll be allocated to one of the remaining eleven to hospital B. We do take into consideration occupational health advice and um, the disability advisors, and if students have. Um, children and care responsibilities but we do tend to make it that you have to be an officially registered carer to be able to do it otherwise everybody wants to go to one hospital and some of our hospitals can take no more than five students so um as it as they said on the tv yeah it's all organized by computer um and they use basically google maps to work out from your term time address to the hospital and it will need to be beneath two hours um there is also opportunities to go to Great Ormond Street, the Brompton National Hospital for Neurology, and Axe and Morley Wing, which is neuro. Um, but again, these are observational placements, and the idea is that you get to see what radiographers can become. Most of these places are grade are band sixes and above, so it's not a newly qualified position. Um, it takes time to get there, so 18 months, two years. 
Um, Kevin's talked about um, accommodation um, and halls and halls, and a lot of first years are in there. And, and I discovered today actually there's halls for second years as well. Um, I think they're more limited, um, but um, one of my second years is living in halls as well. And then the student folk, uh, facilities. I think we can take away the Kingston University Student Union actually. Um, but basically, um, on placement, it's Monday through Friday, and at the university, it's Monday through Friday, but they tend not to have lectures on a Wednesday afternoon, so they can avail of the student sports facilities and student union. Finances, Gavin's already talked about. The only thing I would say to you is that as diagnostic radiographers, the additional monies isn't £5,000, I think it's £6,000, because um, we have that. Um, as a bonus because we are an at-risk profession or an under um, under recruited profession um, so again further information is there and the my admissions tutor is a chap called Rodnick Vassallo and unfortunately he's on annual leave today otherwise he would have been delivering this not me so that's me thank you for listening Amazing. Thanks so much, Tony. Um, so we're going to be um, moving over to the current students now to get their perspective. Um, what I would say is that Tony will be around um, hopefully after that to answer some questions as well. Um, so do just hang on to any questions for now. Um, I'm just going to ask our student um, students to uh, come on. Um, and you'll get to hear from four different students within the first year and the third year. Um, so students, um, if um, you should be able to see the screen now. When your name comes up, if you'd just like to give a quick introduction to yourself, and then I'll move the slides along so you can tell everyone a bit more about your experiences. Um, so Rachel, are you good to have a chat now? Yeah, yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Rachel. I'm a third year student um, studying diagnostic radiography. Um, I'm originally from Orpington, so that's in Kent. Um, so uh, when I first started this course, I just had to move over to London. Um, what drew me to the course was the um, scientific background and um, having studied um, science at A level, um, I really wanted to study something which um, had that application and also um, I like the health background and how I can use that knowledge to help people. Um, another thing that drew me to George's was um, how friendly everyone was um, when I visited um, and also knowing that other people from my sick form uh, came to the uni and they said good things about it. Um, I also loved um, how diverse it was um, being that it was in London um, and I really appreciated um, how there's so many different cultures that I could enjoy in different societies um, I could join as well. And one society I've joined is um, Christian Union. So I'm on committee as a publicity officer in charge of um, the social medias and also um, a volunteering society called um, Teddy Bear Hospital. Um, but yeah, I love all those opportunities at George's. Yeah, that's me. Thank you. Alina, are you good to yeah, talk about good your experiences? Cool. Yeah. So, um, hi everyone. I'm Alina Campbell, and I'm a Year One Diagnostic Radiography student. I'm actually a mature student, so I have two children, and I was really apprehensive about coming to St George's um, or uni just generally when I was looking. And um, a few things that drew me to St George's, other than the science and everything, was um, just the placement of where it actually is, um, the connections for transport, so the train and the buses. I actually live in West London, so it's still um, very accessible for me. And also I had to look at the clinical placement sites and I was really, really happy with where they were located and easy to get to. And with having to arrange childcare and um, get around from different places, it was just really suitable for me that and the fact that a lot of the hospitals had so many different um, specialities and I just wanted to get a good experience of everything really before I make my decision about where I want to go eventually. 
and um, the fact that it's in a hospital was really appealing. I mean, even now when I go in and I sit in Pret and I have a coffee, it's just amazing to be around so many people from different areas of medicine. Like literally you see them coming in and getting coffees and I find that really motivational and really inspiring and it just reminds me why I do or why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, one thing I am enjoying at St George's with COVID and I was really concerned with the learning and how it would be, assuming most of it would be online. But one thing I'm enjoying is actually the interactive learning. So if they have, you use different platforms online and it's just really interactive. And I'm finding that I'm really absorbing all the information that's given to me. So it's a good plus for me. And something I'm looking forward to, well, a few things. Doing my first x-ray is one thing, but clinical placement starts in January for me. So I'm really looking forward to that and also just the avenues of possibilities in terms of career so just climbing the ladder and going in different directions so and oh yeah a tip from me is i actually underwent some experience work experience to get onto this course and just to help me out a bit and i really found it really valuable especially in these first couple of introduction introductionary units i just found it really really useful so if you do have the opportunity to do that, although you don't have to, I would definitely recommend doing so. Um, that's all from me, thank you. Hi, I don't think my camera's working. No, that's fine, Farah. So yeah, unfortunately Farah's camera's not working, but uh, we can hear you, so that's fine. Okay, so I'm just, I'm going to start off. So hi, my name is Farah. I'm a third year diagnostic radiography student. Once again, I'll apologise that my camera isn't working, but I'm sure I'll see you around if you guys join. But um, as you can probably tell, I have a northern accent. I am actually from Leeds. Um, so I moved all the way down here, which was quite far. But I have to say it's been one of the greatest experiences I've ever witnessed. Um, the one thing that drew, drew me towards St George's was the reputation it holds. So it's great that, you know, you could go to any university that does radiography, but St George's is one that has is connected to a, a hospital. So as Alina was saying, you will walk down the the pathways and you will cross people who are who have just come out of surgery or the nurses and you can interact with people all the time everybody's really friendly the lecturers are great help they will always be there to support you the other thing i really liked about st george's was you learn the anatomy through um dissection rooms which i didn't know was even a thing um at other universities um because when i was researching before when I was in your got lots position I didn't know that um but it's been the best experience a lot of people don't like that room but I really liked it so that's where you have a physical body in front of you and you're going to um learn your anatomy it was a it was a great experience and the other thing was um the hospital is a great tertiary center again you know it has a large diversity of patients because London in general is very diverse like um Rachel said um, there's so many cultures there's so much to learn there and it's a great place for research um, I have other radiography student friends at different universities and they're not being pushed to publish their dis uh, the dissertation however in, in our university that's what they're doing and I think that's a great thing to do because there's no point doing all that work and then doing nothing with it so that's generally why I chose to do this um, and why I chose St George's but Hopefully that's good enough for you guys, but that's a little bit about me. Hi there. Um, can everyone hear me all right? Yep. Sure. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Claudia and I'm a first year diagnostic radiography student. Uh, I'm originally from Poland and I've been living in the UK for the past 15 years and the reason why I have chosen to study St George's uh, diagnostic radiography at St George's is due to many reasons one of them like Farah said is due to a great amount of organization through for example dissecting rooms where you can learn the human anatomy 
but also great placements that I will be starting in January where I can apply the knowledge of anatomy and physics together so that I can then treat people and visualize the internal problems that they may have and be able to help them in the long run. Uh, some other reasons why I chose St. George's is because of the multidisciplinary teams that they work with and the how everyone is very goal driven and working as a team to help the students. Uh, whereas if I looked at other universities, they weren't very focused on how important the students are and how their learning should be prioritized. And whenever like I would have any concerns right from the beginning where I started like two weeks ago, all the staff members were really organized, friendly and able to answer every single question. And this would help me immensely to develop my knowledge further into then treating patients in my career, hopefully. That's all from me. Thank you. Amazing. Thanks, everybody. Um, so you found out a bit more about our students and um, I know there's been, so we're going to move on to a, a quick Q&A um, right now. So first of all, I just wanted to ask um, Alina um, a question. So, we can, so I know some um, more mature students, some student parents have been, um, have had some questions. Um, so how are you finding it in terms of kind of working the course um, with children? Um, Alina, how's that going for you? Um yeah so for me it's going well i've obviously had to change a lot of my lifestyle around and arrange different sort of childcare um sort of different things in place but actually i'm finding the balance with being online and obviously going in um helping me a lot and i'm just finding that the time i do have spare even if it's just times on the train and things like that i'm having to use that just to read up and catch on a lecture so it is not easy but it is doable um if you are working full time i i don't know how you would manage it but i certainly if you've got a part-time job and someone there to help you with childcare and stuff it's um doable definitely yeah Sorry, classic error of talking while muted. Um, so students, um, if you're able to come on screen um, and just show your webcams while we do the Q&A, that would be great. I don't know if you're able to um, share your um, webcam, Tony, um, but hopefully you're there for some questions if we um, do have some. Cool, okay. So um, I think there's been a few questions that have come through um, about placements and where they are, but thanks Tony, you gave a really thorough overview of where those are and they are all, there is quite a lot of information on our website. I know about modules and a list of the placements, so hopefully that's um, there for everyone to um, look at. Um, so let's have a look at questions for students. Um, do you guys recommend, maybe for the year three students, do you think it's a good idea to live out um, as half the year as placement. Um, so kind of what, what are your kind of thoughts on living arrangements um, and where you study, um, where, you, where, you, where you're kind of based accommodation wise and placements? Well, I lived in um, halls. Like I said, I was from, from Leeds, but um, my, my um, hospital site, the first one was Frimley. So it was really far away. But it's doable. Um, I think it's a great experience, especially as a first year, to experience what it's like to move out, to understand that responsibility. If I look back at the person I was when I was 18 and before I moved moved to London, I'm much different because of the things you learn generally um, about being responsible, being more independent. There's no one there to go home to to cook for you. You have to do it yourself and you get used to that. And I think it's a big learning curve. And, a great way for you to in, get into adulthood. So I, th I think that is a great thing to do. Um, I would recommend it personally. 
Um, I'll just uh, add to that. Um, as I'm currently at Frimley Park Hospital, so I've moved out to the student um, accommodation nearby. Um, and um, from first year, I was living in Horton Halls anyway, so away from home. And um, adding on to what Farah said, it really does um, help you to experience something different and build more um, independence. And um, I definitely wouldn't change it. I think it's been exciting to um, grow in that area, personally. Fab, thank you. Um, so we've had a couple of questions um, about them um, from um, mature students. And actually, I think this might be a question for Tony. So I'm asking about, you know, other in terms of the, the student population for this course, are there quite a few mature students there already? Um, is that something you can comment on? Um, <clears throat> I think Alina probably could do better on that one, actually, considering that she sat in on the first years and she could see all their smiley faces. Um, it's interesting that. If you'd asked me this question last year or the year before, I would have said that the profile had changed and actually the number of mature students in my current second year and my current third year is much lower than it has been in the past. Um, but I think that what's happened now, and I think a lot of it is pandemic effect, um, is a large, a larger number of students that are coming onto the programme have a much more mature background. But again, the institution's mature background is 21 plus, um, but I would say that probably about a dozen of the current first years, so 20% are mature students. Um, but again, it can vary from one year to the next. It could be, you know, one year you could have close to 40% are mature um, students, and then the next year there could be zero. Um, and there is no quota. It's basically um, who applies, who's interviewed, and you take the best 65, 70 people um, that you've interviewed. Um, and that's what it's all about. It's, we look at um, the quality of interview, um, because what you did at A level, what you did as a personal statement, that gets you to the interview. Um, and it's how you do, how well you do at the interview that is going to decide whether we make the offer to you or not. And then the offer, the, the interview is graded. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. I think it's um, it's reassuring to know, I suppose, if you're a mature applicant, that there are other people who are on the course, like Alina there. So it's not that it would just be you and, you know, tons of them. Um, uh, I don't think so, Alina's yeah. on her own as being a mature student. I think yeah. there's at least half a dozen in your class, isn't there? Yeah, there I find out on Monday, I'm seeing them. There okay. are a few, but honestly, you wouldn't necessarily be able to tell because obviously we look so young anyway. But um, oh, honestly, there's a <laughs> there are a good few. And even before me, I, I was recommended to St George's through someone else that was a mature student years ago. So, uh, you know, I feel really included and I don't feel left out in any way. I don't feel like I stand out. So, um, no, it, there are a few this year, definitely in my year. Fab, thank you. Well, we are running slightly over, everyone, so maybe just have a couple more minutes for questions. What I would say is that um, Tony and our current students will be here to answer questions in the chat for the next 10 minutes or so when we're done. Um, so hopefully you can have your some responses there. Um, this is a good one for you, Tony. Um, what's, what sets St George's apart from other universities for diagnostic radiography? I know you might have covered some stuff in your talk, but what do you think are the main kind of, I guess, selling points for the course at George's? Um. I, I'll be honest, it's it's uh, the location with the paramedics, the physiotherapists, the occupational therapists, um, and the therapeutic radiographers, healthcare scientists, um, all of the MBBS groups, all of the um, other PG and undergraduate post uh, undergraduate qualifications that come through uh, the Institute of Medicine Bio uh, Biomedical Ed Education. Um, I think one of the students, I can't remember which one, uh, who, who it was, um, touched on the fact that it is hospital based. Um, and that can scare the living daylights out of people because, you know, you've only got to watch 24 hours in A&E to realise and to recognise some of the location. And you think, oh, heck, I saw that on Channel 4 or on whatever TV it is on now. Um, but I think that 
it's that close proximity, which from an academic point of view from diagnostic radiography means that, you know, it's much easier to bring in specialists to actually come and deliver keynote lectures as and when. Yeah, you know, my team are actually really, really good. They're brilliant. Um, but we don't cover every specialism um, that there is. I think also everybody's in the same boat. Everybody is in the, oh no, I've got to travel to placement or oh no, I've got to study in the evenings because I'm in placement all day. And I think that having delivered this program at a and i'm going to use the term very loosely a proper universe a true university as in the, the, there's english and there's maths and there's all those other people that don't have a clinical or a a, a, a professional attendance uh, process or going to university going to a job or anything else um you don't end up having to live with people that you know they're out partying until three in the morning which is and, and i'm talking from my students 20 years ago perspective you know they're in halls at you know kingston and they were complaining that they have to get up at six o'clock in the morning to get ready to go to placement uh, for, for you know leaving home at 7 30 8 o'clock um if they're lucky um and all the others were still they, they were rolling in on the thursday morning after being out on a wednesday night um so there is some there is some aspect or some benefit of actually being in the same boat um but realistically i think the the key skill is is the location you know where we are who we are um and what there is around you um so yeah i yeah as i said i wouldn't say i came to i came to george's in 1992 um and went off to and then we moved to Kingston in 93 and then I came back in 2018 so my entire professional in, in teaching career has been George's orientated and I've never felt the need to move on um, and Alina probably is referring to one of my ex-students who advised her um, there's a lot of them out there um, but now I think you would look to see who's around who's been around and who's still here and it gives you some insight into why we're still here um, and we do enjoy it and I think one of the benefits is that it is a small group um, and the people that are involved in the education um, are supportive and I think that's it you could take us and you can parachute us into anywhere as long as you took the people I think that it would be great but I think because where it is it makes it awesome it sounds real cliche I'm sorry <laughs> It's good. I agree. Also, having been at George's for a really long time. Um, okay, I think we've just got, I've got time for one more question. And there's just been a couple. I think because you talked about the um, joint faculty with Kingston University. So, um, in terms of so some people are asking, you know, would they have to go to Kingston University at all for the course? Yeah. So, um, any student that is, um, uh, and, and I've split into two roles. One is groups years one, two and three currently on the program never don't have to go to Kingston. There's nothing there anymore. Um, there are no staff. And as from 20, September 2022, uh, where the current uh, participants in the webinar are probably looking at starting, um, Kingston won't exist in relationship to radiography um, because the joint faculty is being dissolved as of the 31st of July this year of uh, next year 2022 um and all the staff and all the teaching and everything else will be um translated into st george's university of london permanent stuff so yeah nothing to do with kingston sorry Other than kingston hospital. and that's the placement that we use yeah um, also, just to quickly say, I think we've had a few questions, admissions queries as well. So if you have asked some questions that are quite detailed about your entry requirements, um, we will be able to get back to you on those. Um, but we just maybe won't talk about the PFO. So I think we've seen a couple of questions. Try muting yourself, Tony. Just getting quite a lot of interference. Um, so just to clarify as well we have had some questions about foundation years just to clarify that we don't offer a foundation year um, for radiography at st george's yeah we don't do a foundation year per se um but 
a lot of institutions that offer the foundations to science um we do use that we we can consider that um as a route into the first year of the degree program but there's no guarantee uh, one of the advantages of the foundation um route a uh, foundation degree route is that you go from year zero through to either year one or if it's the full foundation FD science then it goes into year two we don't have either of those but if you do a foundation to science at another institution um, then it could be used in lieu of the A levels or access programs or any of other level three qualifications necessary to get onto the degree. Fabulous thanks for clarifying Tony. Okay everyone so um, that's almost the end of the event so just want to say a massive thank you to Tony and all the current students for taking part today um, hopefully you found this session really informative and um, for the next five ten minutes or so um, staff and students will be able to answer your questions on the chat and um, so do just stay on for that if, if you're able to um, I am going to play just before we finish I'm just going to play um, the student support video that we played at the very beginning of the webinar just in case you missed it so that lasts for 15 minutes um, and after that the webinar will close but in the meantime as I say do pop in any questions that you have to the chat if we're not able to answer them today we'll also be able to email you a response after okay so thank you so much for coming along and um, we really hope you found this session informative and hopefully we'll see you at St George's soon um, yeah so um, to half for now if um, you're popping off and like I said I'm just going to play the student support video before we head off. Hello everyone my name is Gavin Taylor and I'm the head of student services here at St George's. Today I'm going to talk to you about some of the support services that we have for students here at St George's. Many of the services we offer are badged under our Student Centre or Student Life Centre banners, and these include things like health, well-being, learning support, finance and accommodation services. Let's have a look at each of those in turn, and I'll give you some highlights of each of the services as we go through. So the first place to start is uh, health. Um, and let's talk about occupational health. Now, the occupational health team are there to ensure that students and staff are fit to undertake their work or their study alongside patients. Um, and they're the ones in the application process um, who will ask you for reports about your health um, and will undertake tests and vaccinate you as necessary. OH are also there to make sure that any health conditions that might affect patient safety are appropriately managed. So they don't vanish on day one of your course. Uh, they're with you all the way through and all the way through your career, in fact, to make sure that you are healthy and OK and all right to work with patients. Now, universities will take a variety of different approaches to supporting the health of their students. Uh, you may find if you've been looking at large campus universities, they've got a health center there on campus. At St. George's, because we're an urban university, um, we work closely with our local GPs, and there are about 20 of them within about a kilometer of the St. George's campus to ensure that everyone has access to all the services that they need. Most of the local surgeries will actually come onto campus for our freshers' fair in your uh, first week, um, and they'll get everybody signed up there um, and um, accessing their services as they go through. That's how we approach um, your health while we're uh, studying. Um, moving on to look at student well-being. Um, so the, the place to start with this one is your personal tutor. So every student at St. George's is assigned a personal tutor from the very first day. Now, tutors have an academic role. Um, they'll be giving you some of your assessments while you're in study. Um, they also have a, a very strong pastoral one, so they're there to make sure that you're okay and succeeding um, and doing your very best right the way through. And that's a big strength of the size of St. George's. Our small size lets us offer that to everybody, and I think it's a real strength of what we do. Now, as well as your tutor and as well as the specialist staff on my team in the Student Life Center, um, St. George's has a very large for our size and very well used counseling service, um, as well as a psychiatrist in-house to support students' mental health. 
We've also got a thriving faith community for a science-based university um, and a chaplaincy that looks after both the university staff and students and the staff at the NHS Trust as well. And we work closely with our students union in all kinds of different things from faith right the way through to all the different activities that they offer to make sure that there's a comprehensive network of support um, within the SU and the university and the trust next door and all the way through all around our students while they're studying with us. From well-being, let's have a look at some of the learning support that's on offer. So uh, again, universities will have different approaches to writing and study skills support, but all of them will have some. Um, here at George's, we operate an academic success center, um, and that's led by three senior lecturers who are there to really make sure that every student at St. George's does as well academically as they possibly can. Um, that includes all kinds of different things from English as a second language su uh, support through uh, writing skills um, and even uh, A-level refresher catch-up sessions for our graduate entry students. So if you're feeling a bit rusty in the chemistry or the stats, um, they'll get you back up to speed when you uh, start with us at George's. We also believe that we've got an ethical as well as a legal obligation to support disabled students. Now, I do get approached from time to time with students concerned that their disability uh, may be a barrier to them taking up their place in a healthcare profession. Um, so just to say from the outset, there are very few, if any, barriers uh, to disabled people ent entering the healthcare profession. There's really no barrier there. And our aim is to ensure that our support is just as rounded as possible to make sure that everybody is supported. Um, and that includes the academic dimension as well as uh, the clinical placements and other things that you'll be doing, as well as all the stuff that surrounds those things, like your housing and other things as well. Now, it is worth just saying that talking to us early if you're disabled really does help us make sure that everything is in place to start supporting you from the very beginning of your studies. It can take a while to get everything up and running and in place that you need. So please do talk to us nice and early so we can make sure that everything is up and running and going. Now, it's also worth just saying that. Um, some students, um, about 50% of people with a specific learning difficulty, find that out at university. Um, and so we offer free assessments uh, to all students um, and free specialist support as well, if that's the situation that you might find yourself in. So let's have a look at finance. So um, I guess the, the first thing that I'd like to say here is really just to reassure you um, there are 2.5 million university students in the UK at the moment. Now, these are folk who are on the same financial footing um, as you will be when you are studying. Uh, the amounts of money involved in higher education at the moment are daunting. Uh, student loans are large. Fees look big. Um, and there's a lot to think about. But just remember, there are 2.5 million people who are managing OK on it. Um, it's not a uh, necessarily an easy thing, but it is a thing that people can do and you can do it too. And we are here to help you do it. So um, just some things to keep in mind. UK tuition fees are currently uh, £9,250. They are largely set by Parliament. Um, will we see things change in the next few years before you start? That's a possibility. Um, and we'll communicate that all the way through. But just for the moment, the data we've got, 9250. Um, Maximum maintenance loan, so this is for UK students um, who are living away from the family home in London. The maximum amount you can get in a loan from Student Finance England is £12,382 per year. Um, and also just to note that students who are undertaking training towards allied health professions, so physiotherapy, radiography, paramedic science, uh, and include, indeed our colleagues doing midwifery and nursing, um, they are also eligible for a bursary from the NHS. Um, of £5,000 per academic year as well. Now, if you're taking out a student loan, there are no upfront costs for attending university. So the Student Finance England or the Scottish equivalent or the Welsh equivalent or the Northern Irish equivalent will pay for your fees. Um, and everybody is guaranteed to receive that loan if they apply for it. So if you're a UK student and it's your first degree, if you're not taking a, uh, a degree, uh, an undergraduate degree for the second time, you are eligible to have it funded by government. Now, the loans that you take out, both for your tuition fees and for your maintenance costs, become repayable after graduation once you're earning more than £27,000 per year. 
Uh, also, just to note that tuition fee and maintenance support is available for all of the programs at St. George's, um, including graduate entry pre-registration courses. Now, you may have heard that, um, a, as an indeed I've just said, uh, that there are limited funds for uh, people who are doing a second undergraduate degree. Now, just to note that for MBBS4, for the Graduate Entry Medicine Program at George's, and the MSc Physiotherapy Program, they are exceptions to that rule. So those courses are uh, fully funded from a variety of different means um, for your studies uh, for the years that you're in. So um, do bear that in mind. Uh, also, just to add, hardship funds are available for all students. We've got a pot of money aside for students who find themselves in unexpected difficulty while they're studying, as will most places. If you find yourself in financial difficulty at any point, do just get in touch and we can help. Now, there are some things that you can start doing now. So I think we're quite early in the application process as I'm talking to you today. So there are some things to get underway with. I think the most important one of those is to get a budget together. Um, for your tuition and maintenance costs and for the amount of money that you might have coming in. Now, there are some great budgeting tools and some finance calculators available online to help you do that. You can find those by checking our website. We'll point you at uh, the, various, the various calculators or the NHS one or the um, Student Finance England one, um, or just Google them. There are loads of things out there, and you can work out within about 20 minutes of online searching just how much you're likely to have as income and how much you're, you're likely to spend uh, as a student living in London um, and let you let you work yourself out of budget for the, the years that you'll be in study. It's really important to do that. It's also a really good idea to look at other sources of funding beyond Student Finance England or the NHS. There are a huge number of trusts and charities and other organizations that are there to support students in higher education, especially those students that are doing healthcare courses. So do get out and have a look for those as well. And then lastly, a quick look at accommodations. So um, things to know there, most undergraduate students, certainly at St. George's, live in halls of residence with us in year one and then move out into private accommodation uh, nearby in subsequent years. That's the typical pattern. Um, we own our own halls of residence, Horton Halls. It's about a mile away from the university main campus and it houses 480 students. That's about 80% of our first year intake who live in halls of residence with us. Um, now, we guarantee places in halls uh, to our international students, uh, disabled students, and students with other welfare needs. We prioritize places for all other first-year students. That includes graduate entry medics, that includes um, master's physician associate students, that includes MSc physiotherapy students. Uh, we have great thriving communities of our graduate entry and postgrad students in halls as well. Um, our halls is for everyone. Similarly, we don't prioritize places based on postcode or distance from campus. So we are looking for folk uh, who want to get away and have a, uh, a moving out of home campus based university experience, even if they live in London already. Um, we're here for you. Uh, in terms of rent, um, to note, we benchmark our rents against uh, local private housing as well as other halls of residence. There's been a great uh, boom in the recent years of uh, private companies coming into the student residential sector uh, that has driven prices up. What we do is we make sure that we benchmark against what housing actually costs in our local area, not just what housing costs look like in higher education. Um, and we keep our rents firmly under control that way. I'd never argue seriously to anybody that uh, staying in halls of residence, even with us, was an inexpensive option. But I would argue looking against local rents, we certainly are a less expensive option in a lot of cases. And halls is an extension of our student services team and is a central part of what we do as a welfare provision. So we really are there to support everybody to uh, move in, start university, have a great time, really get underway with your studies. Um, and, and really get you off on the right foot in terms of university and on into your future career. So it's a, it's a big part of what we do. And I think Halls is a really terrific uh, opportunity and, and a really excellent thing to do in your first year. So that's largely it from me. Um, we've got some of my colleagues who are in the chat already for this webinar. So you can dive in and ask them questions. If you've got anything else that you'd like to know, um, you can contact us through the inquiries team. They'll pass on any uh, individual or complex questions, and we're very, very happy to answer them. Uh, so please just ask us. Um, and 
a slight bonus for me. I'm aware sometimes that we don't just have future students looking at this, but we also have mums and dads uh, looking at this as well. So if you are a mum and dad watching or you want to uh, to let them know a few things if they're concerned, here are a few things that I'd like them to know as well. Um, so uh, the first of that is George's is one of the safest campuses in London per the Metropolitan Police stats. Um, we are a very safe place. We're in a very, very safe part of uh, a big city. Um, students don't behave as you'd imagine is another thing I'd like you to know. Our students typically, as are many university students, our students typically are uh, in employment. Uh, they are typically involved in community activities. Um, the local community is usually very pleased to see our students coming rather than the opposite. Um, they really are a huge boon to the local area. Um, and so our students are, are not as students might normally be perceived to be. Um, universities and George's included will offer support and training to new students and don't pull any punches. We do do um, anti-racism training in our first week. We do anti-sexual violence training in our first week. We don't pull any punches about what our community is about um, or what sort of profession that folks are trying to get into. So um, that will happen in the first week to keep everybody safe, to introduce them to community and really get them thinking about what's going to come ahead. Um, we usually can't talk to you without um, the student directly requesting. Um, and lastly, having the talk, and I don't mean that talk, I mean a talk about finances is hugely invaluable and really, really is probably the best thing that you can do for a student before they get off to university. Anyway, that's my time. Thank you very much for listening to me today. Um, again, there are folk available for questions in the chat um, and we're available really from now until you start and right the way through if you've got to ask us. My name's Gavin Taylor. Thank you very much uh, for coming to see us today online um, and we look forward to seeing you in the future. Okay, everybody, if you're still with us, just to say um, thanks a lot for attending today's event. I am going to be closing the event in a minute. Um, if you haven't had a question answered, we will try and get back to you after the event. But otherwise, take care. Do have a look on our website if you've got any other queries about the course and get in touch via email or phone. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye, everyone.